A year after these reactors at the Fukushima nuclear plant exploded in a triple meltdown, reporters were reminded this is still one of the most hazardous places on the planet. We wore head-to-toe protective gear, full facial respirators, and hazmat suits. And then we drove up to the world's worst nuclear accident in 25 years. This is our first look on the ground at the reactors. This is the heart of the nuclear problem in Japan. What you're seeing over my shoulder are the reactors. There are four of them. The two that you see over my right shoulder, those are two of the reactors that exploded in the early days of this disaster. When you take a look at the reactors, you can see that they have a long way to go. This is a year after this disaster, and you can see that the force of the explosion crippled those buildings. You can understand how so much radiation spewed from this point when you're standing here. An army of 3,000 workers are now here daily in shifts to control the melted nuclear fuel and contain the further spread of the radiation. Inside the on-site crisis management building at the plant, a control center monitors their progress and safety 24 hours a day. The highest risk we still see is if something goes wrong with the reactors, says plant manager Takeshi Takahashi. The plant is in cold shutdown. But the nuclear fuel needs constant cooling, and the situation is far from over. TEPCO says the plant won't be decommissioned for at least 30 to 40 years. The challenge is evident as we drive around the Fukushima plant. Debris, still mangled from the tsunami, sits untouched because of radiation concerns. These blue tanks and these larger gray ones hold water contaminated with radiation. TEPCO is continuously challenged with finding more space for the water. Work conditions and safety, while they've improved since the early days of the disaster, remain a constant concern. Saori Kanasaki used to give tours to the public at the Fukushima nuclear plant. Before the accident, I explained to many people that the nuclear power plant is safe, she says. Now that this has happened, I feel very sorry I ever said that. Kanesaki also lived here in Tomioka. She's now an evacuee, uncertain of when or if she can ever return home. A year later, she and 78,000 others are the legacy of this accident, paying the price when nuclear energy goes wrong. Kyung La, CNN at the Fukushima nuclear plant. The head of the U.S. nuclear regulator has praised the recent disclosure of its minutes, showing how it handled the Fukushima nuclear accident. In an interview with NHK, the chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Gregory Yatsko, said, the minutes showed that information must be shared during a crisis. I think it's a very important historical record. Uh, for people to see how we went about our response, for people to uh, have an opportunity to tell us ways that we can do our, our job better. The 3,000 pages of transcripts released last month cover the panel's conferences over 10 days from March 11th last year following the nuclear accident. Referring to snarled communication at the beginning of the accident, Yatsko said it's important to put protocols in place so that information is shared between the United States and Japan and with all nuclear regulators. At a commission meeting last month, Yatsko was the sole opponent among five members to a plan to build the first new reactor in the U.S. in 34 years. Uh, I think that's a common sense uh, approach given the severity of the accident in Japan. We certainly don't want a new plant to start up with known deficiencies and known weaknesses relative to the accident in Japan. Regarding cooperation between the U.S. and Japan, Yatsuko said the Commission would provide support and advice on water decontamination and other problems if asked.
New research suggests a possible future earthquake centering on Tokyo could be as devastating as the one that hit northeastern Japan last March. Japanese seismologists say an expected powerful tremor in northern Tokyo Bay would have a focus shallower than earlier estimated. They say such a quake would register the maximum seven on the Japanese seismic scale. The scientists released their report after a five-year study commissioned by the government. They analyzed the underground geology of the Kanto area based on data from about 300 seismographs. Results show that the focus at the point where the Philippine Sea Plate descends beneath the Japanese continental plate is about 10 kilometers shallower than expected. Typically, the shallower the epicenter, the greater the jolts on the surface. The government had previously estimated the maximum intensity of a quake at 6 plus, a full rank lower than the new study predicts. The group plans to further analyze its work and publish a final report by the end of March. Seismologists often look to the past to try to give projections about the future. Many of them have been studying the March 11th earthquake. A researcher in Kyoto now says it triggered about 80 separate tremors. One of them was as far as 1,300 kilometers from the original epicenter. Masatoshi Miyazawa is an associate professor at Kyoto University's Disaster Prevention Research Institute. He analyzed data recorded by hundreds of seismographs across Japan immediately following the earthquake. The results show about 80 separate jolts occurred within about 15 minutes of the original quake. The red here indicates the areas that were shaken. And we can also get an idea of the size of these tremors. Many of them were small with a magnitude of around 2. But seismographs also measured a quake with a magnitude of 4.7, which is considered relatively strong. The earthquake that was 1,300 kilometers from the epicenter of a March 11th tremor was observed in Kagoshima Prefecture in southwestern Japan. A giant earthquake off Sumatra Island in 2004 is also known to have triggered smaller quakes. But researchers say the ones that happened on March 11th were unprecedented in scale and number. A new robot has been developed to more efficiently explore the inside of nuclear reactor buildings damaged by last year's quake and tsunami in Japan. The robot was built by machinery maker Topi Industries at the request of Tokyo Electric Power Company that operates the nuclear power plant. It's 50 centimeters tall and more compact than the currently used model. It's equipped with five cameras and also a radiation checker. Now because it's so small, the robot can move around on staircase landings that are only about 70 centimeters wide. It's also designed to negotiate steep staircases. Now, what's more, it can wade into pools of water about three centimeters deep and even work under dripping water. I hope the robot will help reduce the exposure of nuclear plant workers to radiation.